Let me know when you're ready. Okay. Kids really enjoyed the birthday cards you sent. <laughs> cool. Hannah's moving into an apartment next week. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Munsville? Munsville. Outside of Oneida. And of course, Jake's still living in the in the Cheryl apartment.
Dallas vacuuming. <laughs> He's going to school. Pre-K. All day. It is, but it's good for me. Right. Good morning, church. I know we're few in number. I know the Patinos had their first band competition, or marching band competition yesterday. So I imagine they're kind of exhausted, so we won't see them today. Uh, Joe uh, Davis, of course. We are uh, playing tag team at Brewerton United Methodist Church. So I was there last week. He's there this week. Wonderful. And so doing the same service that he did last week there. And I'm doing the same service that I did last week here. And uh, we coordinated our efforts so that uh, we're building upon one another's themes and work. So we just want you to know that, what's going on. And so we just appreciate your presence with us. And as we gather together, I would remind you of the same passage that uh, he opened up with this last week. And this is the passage from 1 Corinthians chapter 9. Do you not know that in a race all the runners run, but only one gets the prize? Run in such a way as to get the prize. Every, everyone who completes, competes in the games do, goes into strict training. They do it to get a crown that will not last, but we do it to get a crown that will last forever. Therefore, I do not run like a man running aimlessly. I do not fight like a man beating the air. No, I beat my body and make it my slave so that after I have preached to others, I myself will not be disqualified for the prize. Please join me in our call to worship. We gather in this holy place, looking for strength to endure, longing for peace to well up within, waiting to be challenged by that so that we may be uncomfortable to hear desiring an outpouring of God's Spirit. We gather together in holy anticipation, and God meets us here. Please join me in my opening prayer. You are great in every way, O God, and greatly to be praised. Your mighty power is unfathomable for mere humans to understand. Even so, we know that you are present at all times and in all places. We dare to ask for whatever power we may need to live the best lives that may glorify you. Gracious God, we are your children. And as your children, we are called to confront giants and to venture away from the safety of the shore where storms arise. We look for victory over all that may distort and destroy our lives. We praise you that you go with us and your word has the power to slay the giants and to calm the seas. Through our worship, provide the power that we need for this day and for the days ahead. We need you to give us the victory. And in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. I, if you are, feel like you'd like to, you're welcome to stand and sing our first hymn with us, which is Victory in Jesus, number 370. I heard an old old story How the city came from glory How he gave his life on Calvary To sing the wretch like me I heard about Oh, 
wants a benefit that you're already standing because that makes it easier for you to turn and greet your neighbor with the peace and love of Jesus Christ. Good morning, my dear. I tell you on that <laughs> hymn. How are you doing? Thanks for the hug. I don't mind well, comparing churches, said, nah, but uh, at Burton, they had few people like we have this morning. But when we sang that hymn, let me tell you, it was all oh, victory in Jesus. We're missing the victory. I thank you for seeing the way it's supposed to be, and that's uh, Sylvia's credit to helping us lead that, that way. Thank you. Hear, O Israel. The Lord is our God, the Lord alone. You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your might. That's the Shema that all Hebrews will say during their day and also the beginning of their worship. And so we start that today, and instead of saying it and repeating it, we sing it. Passages, John 10:10, 10, 10, Romans 5:20, Colossians 2, and 2 Corinthians 9, and Ephesians chapter 3. Would you proclaim your faith with me? It is an uncommon faith, not a common faith, that we rally behind. We believe that Jesus came, that we might have life and have it abundantly. We believe that in God's love, where our sin increased, grace abounded all the more. We believe that as we received Christ Jesus the Lord, so we should live in him, rooted and built up in him, and established in the faith, 
just as we were taught, abounding in thanksgiving. We believe that God is able to provide us with every blessing in abundance, so that by always having enough of everything, He may share abundantly in every good work. We believe that Jesus Christ is the power at work within us, and he is able to accomplish abundantly far more than all we can ask or imagine. To him be glory in the church and in Christ Jesus to all generations, forever and ever. Amen. You'll notice that in our uncommon faith, our creed this morning, the word abundant is there. God provides for us abundantly. And because if we are walking in Christ, he provides an abundant life for us. Not necessarily meaning a life that does not have its challenges or trials, but he provides for us so that we can overcome, we can persevere, we can rise above, and we can know we are loved and that he loves us and that we have a future in him. Let's sing together. Lord, be glorified. son-in-law on the lake and then also spends time down with her son down in Florida. Um, she's up there in years but she loves us and has participated with us and uh, we just want to celebrate her birthday as well. So would you, if Amy is watching via our broadcast, uh, would you join me in singing happy birthday to her? A happy birthday to you, a happy birthday to you. May you feel Jesus dear every day of the year. Happy birthday to you, a happy birthday to you, and the best that you've ever had. I believe Amy told me that this week she was going off camping with her husband mm -hmm. and children, so that's why they're not here. And we also want to be lifting up in prayer uh, Michelle, as, as you know, some people may not be here because of the great New York State Fair. And um, I know that um, uh, Michelle not only has to be at the fair, she has to work at the fair because she works for the health department. So we might want to be praying for Michelle. She's had quite a time, I'm sure, already. Are there other joys or concerns that you would like to lift up and share? It's always good to see yes, Pam I'm and Peter. I'm here, and after four months and last year, I now Oh, praise the Lord. Awesome. Awesome. And then we also have Russ, who has a great rejoicing, is that they have a protocol of treatment, and it's not so severe. So it's got five weeks, right? 
or five treatments. Five treatments. And so he is a rich man. They put gold in his lungs. Okay. <laughs> that's to mark where they need to, to kill that thing that's bothering him. So we praise God for that. Are there other joys or concerns? Yes. Yep. <laughs> so we want to be praying for Mike in your street ministry. Uh, Darren delivers the sandwiches uh, that we make. Or we make packed lunches. Uh, we do over 100, and uh, he, we also make some extra, and he takes some so he can interact with people on the street himself. Uh, we've also purchased uh, cases of Bibles in which he also distributes. Gave four away. Right? Gave four away. Okay, very good. Yes. Yeah, very good. And so he, uh, one of his interactions with a man with named Mike, and he looked. Uh, yep. No better way of trying to fulfill the commission that God gave us that we should uh, feed the hungry, clothe the naked, visit those in prison. And prison is not necessarily those who are behind bars. People live in prison here and here. Yeah, and we visit them and make a difference in their lives. Thank you, dear. That's prison. No. So we thank you for that ministry. We want to remember to pray for Mike. Are there other persons that we can lift up, uh, either in joy or in prayer? I do have an update on Jane McChesney. I talked to her husband, Chick. He's part of our men's fellowship. And uh, Jane just began the first of her treatments for pancreatic cancer. And, uh, you know, so they caught it early. So let's pray that they'll be able to. Uh, uh, she's had many cancers. Once she gets rid of one, they seem to pop up other places. That's the thing with cancers. So we want to be praying for, for uh, Jane. As, and pray, pray for Chick as well. So let us go into a time of silent reflection and prayer. Now I want to remind you that we have prayer cards within, your, within the pews. And also in the lounge there are some prayer cards. If you like, have someone you'd like to be praying for, we can put on the list. Then please complete a card. Put it in the offering plate when they're passed or in the basket that's out in the lounge. And we'll be glad to pray for them. We keep our prayers, uh, unless they're renewed, we keep them for about two weeks. So uh, please, let us be praying for you and for others whom you love. Let's be in silent prayer and reflection. for those who are facing hunger, who need shelter. We pray for your intervention. Hear our prayers. Lord, for those who are struggling with disease, we ask that you might provide hope and a sense of your presence. Lord, hear our prayers. Lord, for those who feel alone and isolated, those who feel broken or chased by their past, bring them to a new sense of freedom. Lord, 
hear our prayers. Lord, for the people of our nation, as they are so divided and in competition for power, Lord, you are the one who has the power and deserve the glory and the honor. We give it to you. Lord, hear our prayers. Lord, for those who live in war zones, for innocence, and for those who are battling over issues of dominance, oh Lord, we ask for peace. Hear our prayers. Lord, we dare ask these things and many other things for ourselves and also for others. In the name of Jesus, who taught us to pray, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from you. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory forever and ever. Amen. May I have the ushers come forward that they might receive our gifts back to God through the ministry of this church. Seated and be comfortable. To let you, to let you know that uh, there are many who contribute to us. Uh, you'll find it in uh, our pews, our plates. There'll be envelopes that come to us from all over the place, from people who watch us remotely on our broadcast. And we thank you for your giving, for it helps keep us going and thriving. Let us now listen to the word of God that comes to us from Paul's letter to the Philippians, chapter 3, verses 4 through 16. 
God, we must say, I, first and foremost, I got to thank my Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. I can do all things with strength through Him. And I couldn't do anything without Him talking to homeless people. And being up here, with a snap of a finger, I told Pastor Brian I'd always be ready to be up here. And I could read the questions of faith if you like that. That's fine. I'll go. You want me to start with one? Uh, we'll start with just uh, we'll go ahead. You can start first. Okay. All for Christ. Finally, my brethren, rejoice in the Lord. For me to write the same things to you is not tedious, but for you it is safe. Beware of dogs. Beware of evil workers. Beware of mutilation. For we are the circumcision who worship God in the Spirit, rejoice in Christ Jesus, and have no confidence in the flesh. Though I also might have confidence in the flesh. If anyone else thinks he may have confidence in the flesh, I am more so circumcised the eighth day of the stock of Israel, the tribe of Benjamin, a Hebrew of Hebrews, concerning the law, a Pharisee, concerning zeal, persecuting the church, concerning the righteousness, which is in the law, blameless. But what things were gained to me, these things I have count lost for Christ. Yet indeed, I also count all things lost for the excellence of the knowledge of Christ Jesus for my Lord, for whom I have suffered the loss of all things and count them as rubbish, that I may gain Christ and be found in him, not having my own righteousness, which is from the law, that which is through faith in Christ, the righteousness which is from God by faith, that I may know him and the power of his resurrection and the fellowship of his sufferings, being conformed to his death, if by any means I may attain to the resurrection from the dead. Not that I have already attained or am already perfected, but I press on that I may lay hold of that for which Christ Jesus has also laid hold of me. Brethren, I do not count myself to have apprehended, but one thing I do, forgetting those things which are behind and reaching forward to those things which are ahead. I press towards the goal for the prize of the upward call of God in Christ Jesus. Therefore, let us as many as are mature have this mind, and if anything you think otherwise, God will reveal even this to you. Nevertheless, to the degree that we have already attained, let us walk by the same rule, let us be of the same mind, Word of God for the people of God. Thanks. Thanks. Questions of faith. What traits do you recognize in others that you wish you possessed? What in you gives you confidence you will succeed as you face life's challenges? What prevents you from winning the race of life? <laughs> Join me in a hymn of preparation. Ask you what great thing I know.
disciple, you must deny yourself, take up your cross, and follow me. Jesus also said that in us we lose our life, we shall not find it. For whoever loses their life for my sake shall truly find it. Those words are reflected in that hymn which also reminds us that the prize we win and that we chase after as Christians is to be like him, to share the same crucifixion, not dying on a cross, but a different type of cross. The cross of saying, this is my life, I die to it, I find my life in you. A lot of people have been looking at, you know, the Olympics and their past from us. I know. Joe mentioned that last week. Would you turn off your phone there, Don? Okay, good. <laughs> that there is a people watching the Olympic Games. They're now over. There, for me, I was kind of watching the uh, when I could the Tour de France. That's of greater interest for me. But I have a little girl in my house, and, and Kathy will show her picture. Her name is Lydia. And Lydia loved watching the Olympics. She bumped me from the Tour de France because <laughs> she had to watch the Olympics. She was taken by a young woman you know of named Simone Biles, Biles excuse me, who was an exceptional gymnast. She was motivated. She's always been my tree climber. She's always been the the athletic one. And so she decided she wanted to go to the Olympics sometime. So she wanted to be a gymnast. So we talked to her, her mother talked to her, and said, well, you know, it may not happen. And, you know, she wanted to go to take gymnastics. And said, you know, this is an investment, and it takes a lot to be able to be accomplished. Well, she's been in it, what, four weeks now? Three weeks? Three weeks. The first week, she accomplished something on the balance beam that was before her time. And she had the privilege of being able to rush over and ring the bell. This last week, as you can see, she accomplished some other tasks beyond what they have expected. One well, of the coaches said that most of them don't get to earn a ribbon until after a year. But you can see that Lydia came home with three ribbons. <laughs> One of the things that we want to impress upon her is that, you know, you have to invest yourself. If you have something that you want to accomplish, you have to invest yourself. Amen. That's the same thing that happens with our faith. That's why first... Corinthians 9, Joe and I focused on, do you not know that in a race all the runners run, but only one gets the prize? Not everyone gets the prize. Run in such a way as to get the prize, and if you're going to run in such a way as to get the prize, you have to go into strict training. You have to invest yourself. And what they get will be a crown that will not last. But we do it to get a crown that will last forever. And then he says, so I do not run aimlessly. I am focused. I am disciplined. 
I beat my body into sub submission so that I can accomplish, have the best advantage to accomplish and win my race. I got a few points that I want to share with you today. The first one, you know, is that you don't win unless you join the race. One of the struggles that I have with Christians personally, and I love all those who confess Christ as their Savior and Lord, but I notice as a pastor over the years that there are some who invest themselves in their faith, and there are others who do not. It's like they settle for mediocrity. This is what I got to do. I feel safe. So this is what I get. There are those who are never satisfied where they are spiritually, and so they invest themselves. It's like running a race. And I'm not meaning to try to pat myself on the back. Please understand that. But I've never been satisfied where I am. I'm 69 years old and I'm not satisfied with who I am and where I am in my faith. I pray and hope that I never come to that place where I'm satisfied. I relish in the fact that I have a sense of feeling of being dissatisfied. Because being dissatisfied pushes me to enter the race and to invest in the race. And what is the race? The race is as Paul said in 2 Timothy chapter 4, 7, and 8. He said at the end of his life, he says, I have fought the fight. I have run the race. I have kept the faith. Now what is, what is waiting for me is the crown of righteousness that Christ shall give me. And not only for me alone, but for all those who run the race. I've seen churches who have settled for mediocrity. Here I am, we do our thing. You come to church, you do what you can, but then you leave, and, but that's it. Or maybe you do a devotion at home or whatever, but they don't see their life as running a race. I run a race. Other people I know run a race. There are always challenges before me, challenges within myself, that I must struggle with and battle with. And just when I think I've won victory over one, doggone it, there's another one I have to struggle with. It's never over. But yet, that doesn't mean there's not a rest that we have in Christ. You see, the battle is not mine alone. I could have had a son sing a, a passage, the battle belongs to the Lord. Because the battle does belong to the Lord. Because I know when I battle, the battles that I have to face with myself or from outside, if I use my own resources, then I'm doomed for failure. Why? Because I've tried it that way before. And I've run into brick walls. You don't run a race when you run into brick walls. You can scale the walls. I remember having to scale a cargo net which I hated because they aren't stiff and they sag and you have to climb and you have to do it in a certain amount of time. But there are challenges that we all have. But you know, we don't have any challenge unless we enter the race. Only you can ask yourselves, and I'm not beating down on you, it's just the word is telling you, are you running the race? What is the race? The race will be to be giving our best of ourselves and our life to life. The best of ourselves is a gift of, that we give back to God. This is what I give back. This is what he receives. It's not just in an offering plate. It is the offering of our lives. How do we have that victory in our lives? First, enter the race. Unless you race, Unless you run, there's nothing to win. I appreciate what I'll have tomorrow morning. I appreciate you, but I appreciate the group of people that I'll have tomorrow morning at Town Center in Fayetteville. At their age, all those people, except for John, John comes and he's not their age. 
but they, they are running a race, even at their older age. They want to know more. I'm telling you, they challenge me with some tough questions. And they give some wonderful answers from their own life experience in running the race in Christ. It's a wonderful thing. They're involved in the race, no matter what their age. Are we involved in the race of faith? The race for our lives. God provides abundantly for those who enter the race. And you know, unlike a human race, where only one gets the prize, and then it's soon forgotten, gets on the shelf. Ours, all those who run the race, win the prize. Isn't that a wonderful thing? We can be a winner in life. We can be a winner in eternity. There are no losers. The only loser is those who do not enter the race. Otherwise, you are all winners. Paul focuses on this, and he talks about his resources. He says, if anyone else thinks they have reason to put confidence in their flesh, confidence in their own ability, who they are, the gifts that they have been given, the opportunities they have, if they think that they have reason to put confidence in the flesh, he says, I have more. And what he states may not resonate with us. I mean, you know, because none of us count circumcision as, as something that's a benefit. But it marked him as being a member of the chosen people of God. He says, I'm a member of the people of Israel, God's chosen people. I, matter of fact, even more than that, I am a member of the tribe of Benjamin. I am a Hebrew of Hebrews. In regards to the law, a Pharisee. Who did Jesus challenge so often? The Pharisees? He says, I am a Pharisee. I am one who is noted in the community of religious people as being an active, vibrant follower of God. For zeal, I even persecuted the church. As for legalistic righteousness, I followed all the rules perfectly. I was looked upon, man, that's a great spiritual man. But then he goes on to say, but whatever was to my profit, I now consider loss for the sake of Christ. I don't know about you, but I was raised, and I mentioned this before, by Robert and Virginia Holman. I have a spiritual heritage that gave strength to my life. I praise God for that. I had people in my life, surrounded by people of my life and faith, but, you know, that didn't make it for me. As I got to be in my senior, uh, my teenage years, I had to run the race myself. I couldn't depend upon all the benefits I had. I couldn't depend upon the opportunities of education. Education is great, but that wasn't going to help me win the race if I just used that and excluded God. I had many gifts and talents and abilities that people acknowledged me, and I worked for many of them, but, you know, that wasn't going to win the race. As a matter of fact, when I found myself in college, I found myself losing the race. I wasn't the person I wanted to be. I wasn't the person God wanted me to be. I wasn't the person my parents hoped I would be. I was losing the race. Whatever was to my profit, I consider lost. What gifts do you have? What has God given you in your life? Whatever it is, it's not going to make you a winner at the end of your journey. They may be resources that God can use in your life to help you win the race, but they in and of themselves will not help you win the race alone. So the first thing of finding victory, we say a victory in the first hymn, put no confidence in the flesh. He even goes on to, to say something else. I consider everything a loss compared to the surpassing greatness of knowing Christ Jesus my Lord, you, you could give me all sorts of diplomas and you could give me plaques. I have a few actually given to me by the church. The Denman Award, coveted one time, now sits in a, in a tub 
underneath the stairs in my house. It means nothing to me. It doesn't gain me anything. I consider uh, the only thing that I want is to know Jesus Christ as my Lord. And then he says, I consider them rubbish now that I might gain Christ. Now that's an interesting word, rubbish. The real word is demizan. You don't have to remember that. I don't remember it. <laughs> demizan. And what it really means, well, there's a word that people commonly use. It starts with S and it ends with T. And it has two letters in between. Okay? So you can fill in the gaps. Okay? I count everything as damaged goods. That's what it really means. Damaged goods. Everything that I may gain Christ and be found in him. I want to know him, he says. And the power of the resurrection, meaning I want to give my life over to Jesus and I want his power to be infused in my life and help bring me to victory. I don't want to go through the motions. I want victory in every aspect of my life. And so I'm invested in the race. I'm invested in the game. That's what it means. The second thing. The focus is on Christ and being like him. What is our motivation? Our motivation is so important. Repeatedly through the scriptures, there are people who are motivated for money. They're motivated for power. They're motivated for fame. Paul even talks about some who are proclaiming the gospel who have bad motivation, right? We say that on Monday morning, didn't we? God looks at the motivation of our heart. We may fall flat on our faith, face, but when we try, and our motivation is we want to please God. Oh, oh, that's what gives a smile. <laughs> You know, if Lydia never makes it to the Olympics, Grandpa's gonna, and Grandma are going to be happy with her because she's tried her best to be her best. God does that with us too. The only thing that shames God that he despairs over is what we don't even try. We just settle for what is. What's your motivation? Paul says, I want to be like Christ. I want to experience the power of his resurrection. The third thing he says, not that I've already obtained all this or have already been made perfect. I press on to take hold of that for which Christ Jesus took hold of me. John Wesley, we're still Methodists. We may not be United Methodists. But John Wesley said the important thing is sanctification and pressing on towards perfection. To press on means you don't give up. You invest yourself. You sweat it out. You do whatever it takes to be able to be successful. If I want to be forgiving, I have a hard time being forgiving. I work at it. If I want to be more loving, oh, there's a hymn by that. Make me more loving. I have to work at it. My feelings might say something totally different. I don't want to love that person. I'm going to love them. I'm going to love them the way God wants me to love them. I'm going to do it for Jesus. But actually I'm doing it for myself because if I do it for Jesus, it's going to be a reward for me in my heart because I know I'm pleasing Jesus. Whatever it is, we press on. Do I need to read and pray more? Do I need to fellowship more deeply? Yeah. i got to do whatever it takes to be accomplished in order to try to reach the prize. I press on. One thing I do, he says, forgetting what is the past, I press on. Now, what is the past? The past is the good things that I've done. The past is the good things that I'm able to do because God has given me the capability to do them. I put that behind me. Anything that I've won at or accomplished at spiritually in my life, that's the past. Every failure when I try to be my best and give my best, every failure is in my past. I live today. And today is when I need to press on to 
move forward. There are churches who do not press on to move forward. There are Christians who settle and are haunted by their past and settle for what they experience now. And you know why some people are in church? Because they played the game and they found it didn't do anything for me. And the reason why I didn't do anything for them, because they were not invested. They weren't willing to vest themselves. They, as in the Navy SEALs, they couldn't make it, and so they rang the bell, I give up. I give up. But those who truly want to know the resurrection, the power of the resurrection, we don't give up. We press on. We press on. Towards the goal to win the prize for which God has called me heavenwards. You know, we're all called. Not everyone will answer that call. But we are all called. It isn't God's fault when we do not want to obtain what God wants us to have. We choose. We choose. But whatever it is, if you press on or don't, he says, let us live up to what we have already attained. Let's not surrender. Let us not give in. The word today, and what Joe and I have been wanting to do last week and this week, is to help you realize that Jesus and God wants to focus on just as with the sheep, not on the fact of whether you're of the sheep or the goats. He wants us to focus on come, come into my presence, come experience the joy your master that's our motivation I encourage you that as we enter into a fall as we enter a time when we're going to define and more of our people are back we're going to define who we are that you're willing to invest yourself in growing in Christ and that we as a church likewise invest ourselves Lord, I ask that you might be with us where we have given up or slacked off. Oh God, inspire us, move us, push us, kick us in the pants. Do whatever you have to do. Bring us back to you. Oh, as we look at our world, oh, our world needs you, Lord. And how are they going to see you? How are they going to find you unless we share you? Unless we model you? Unless we live for you? Instead, we give up on our world. We give up on our country. Let us be true patriots that live for you. Make us strong. Help us to win the race that you set before us. It's tough, Lord. We get tired. But when we come to you, you will always give us what we need. What we need is you. For you have won the victory. In the name of Jesus, amen. I invite you to stand and lift your voice with me to sing number 374, Standing on the Promises of God. Oh, my God. 